Welcome to Church at the Crossing. My name is Andrew. I'm one of the pastors here. I want to say welcome to you. If you are new or if you are here for the first time, I'm so glad that you decided to spend your Sunday with us. I also want to say hello if you're watching online in real time today. We're glad that you're worshiping with us as well. I want to tell you that our staff and our leaders here at Church at the Crossing would love to know how can we be praying for you in the upcoming week? Do you have a need? Is there um, a need in your life, a need in your family? Is there a concern that you have? You can let us know your prayer requests simply by using the Church at the Crossing app on your device and, and sending those in there, and our team will be praying for you. I also want to mention that the app is a safe and secure way for giving. The, the giving of our church is what fuels the mission and the vision of Church at the Crossing. And you can give safely on the app or, of course, there are donation boxes on your way out here in the room. I want to tell you, uh, last weekend we sent out a call uh, because our partners in Bangladesh asked us for help. Uh, the local churches on the ground in Bangladesh told us that there is a food shortage in that region, in that country, and they asked us for funds to help local families plant and raise self-sustaining gardens for their families. And I'm pleased to tell you that in just one week, our church has raised enough funds to fully support over 80 families in their gardens so they can have food. Praise God. So it's things like that that we get to do because of your generosity, making a difference, sharing the love of Jesus around the world. Well, we're gonna worship together, so I wanna invite you to stand if you're here in the room with me. And we're gonna pray before we sing and worship. I don't know what your week has looked like. I don't know what you're carrying on your shoulders, what's on your mind here today. But there's one thing I know. All of us have the same thing in common. Whether you're a man or a woman, whether you're young or you're older, we have the same thing in common. You wanna know what that is? We are here because we want more of God. In some way, in some form, we want more of his love, we want more of his goodness, we want more of him. And so let's pray with that expectation. God, we want more of you today. We want more of your grace, more of your presence. We come here, God, from all sorts of backgrounds, coming from a variety of different weeks and activities, and we come here in this moment to worship you because you are our God and you love us. And today we remember and we celebrate the great gift and sacrifice of Jesus the one who died, the one who bled on the cross as a substitute for us, and the one who rose from the dead, the one who is seated at the right hand of the Father, the one who has redeemed us and purchased us and healed us. We remember him today. And so God, we want more, more of you. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. We are so glad that you're here, church family online. We're so glad that you joined us today. We've come to worship. We've prepared for these moments together. This is your chance. Use your voice. Let's worship together. He is doing great things, and we get to celebrate that today. Let's rejoice. Take a deep breath. We're in the presence of God. Let's worship and praise Him today. Yes. 
through every storm and no matter what fear comes our way it is lessened it is removed because of the presence and the love of God let's sing this song together when darkness tries to roll over my bones when sorrow tries to steal the joy I own when brokenness and pain is all I know, oh, I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance. Power that can save this power 
Church, you can have a seat as I read this verse. Just soak these words in. In Psalms 139, it says, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there, your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night. But even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. God, hear our worship this morning. free to be 
Good morning. Uh, welcome to Church of the Cross. My name is James. And today uh, we're in our third week of Bless This Home series. And again, whether there's one person in your home, two or ten, the goal is, is what do we need to do to set our lives up for God to bless our home? And I wholeheartedly believe that God wants to bless every single one of your homes. And I wholeheartedly believe that this is the goal for us as a community, that we will not just be called a Christian home, but that we will be Christ-centered homes. And so today, it's going to be a little bit of a challenging message for some of you. If you got some beef in your family at all, today's going to be a little challenging. But I know that the grace and mercy of God can be with you as we go through this message. Let's pray and prepare our hearts, okay? God, we just come to you today, and we're just thankful today. Uh, By the end of this service, we're going to be celebrating 27 baptisms this summer. We give you praise for that, Father. We give you praise for the the transformation uh, of lives that you are doing right now. And God, we want you to continue to transform our souls, transform our lives. But God, part of that comes from us 
living out your word and being obedient. So uh, speak to us today, bring healing today, challenge us today. In Jesus' name, we all say amen. All right. Uh, Last week, I... uh, ran across one of those stories. You ever want to run across those stories where you're like, I'm going to need to read this a couple times. This is so good. And this is so crazy. And so I found one of these stories. Now you might've read it too. Uh, I, I just had to read it several times. Now I'm going to just read to you the introduction and then I'll give you some of my thoughts on it. Here we goes. All right. <clears throat> Here's the introduction of the article. During her husband's memorial service at Wiley Funeral Homes in Baltimore, Demetra Street, sat in the front row. Now, pay attention here. She was wearing a brown striped pantsuit. There's about 25 people who watched as she sang, his eye is on the sparrow, in memory of her husband, Ivan Street. Now, she was doing this in a room with a framed photograph of her husband, and beside her husband was the urn. Now, immediately after uh, the January service ended, a funeral employee allegedly, allegedly took their urn and hid it away, according to the lawsuit filed by uh, Street this past month. When Street asked, hey, uh, can I have my husband's ashes? Uh, the staff refused, and here's why. The article goes on to say that was because Ivan's ashes were not in the urn. Ivan's body, she claimed that she later learned, was buried at Baltimore's Mount Zion Cemetery three days earlier at the request of another woman claiming to be the man's wife. Get that drama? That's some drama. Oh, my Lord. Like I said, I read this story multiple times. I was very fascinated. Okay, let me summarize the rest of the story for you. All right, here's, let me break it down. One man died. Two women came forward saying, uh, we're his wife. We are the wives of this man. And so the funeral company reached out and told at least one wife about this issue, okay, that another woman was claiming to be the man's spouse. But once the funeral home realized that the ladies were not going to resolve this issue on their own, the funeral company came up with a plan. And here it is. Three days before uh, the one wife got up and sang, his eye is on the sparrow in front of a crowd next to an empty urn, the funeral company had another funeral with the supposed wife and buried the remains at the local cemetery. Yes, this man had two funerals unbeknownst to either wife. And to be fair, he was not aware of this either. That's a little too soon. I'm sorry. All right, the lawsuits are coming. And here's my thought on this. Okay, the funeral home found themselves in a predicament. And instead of making peace, they decided to keep peace. All right? Huge difference. I just said something and the money just went, whew. I'm going to say it again. Instead of making peace, they decided to keep the peace. There's a huge difference between making the peace and keeping the peace. See, the through the funeral company thought that they could keep the peace by having two funerals. And it worked until one wife wanted her husband's ashes. So peace was kept until it wasn't. And now they have a bona fide mess on their hands. You see, keeping peace, keeping peace works for a while until it doesn't. And that's why Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, he says this. He says, blessed are the what? Peacemakers. Very fascinating here. Not peacekeepers, peacemakers. And here's what happens. Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers because when we have these peacemakers, the world will look to them. The world will actually look to them and say, hey, these are the children of God. These are God's people. And if we're going to strive not to just be a Christian household in name, but a Christ-centered home, then we're going to need to take some big steps to go from being peacekeepers to peacemakers. And I believe that God wants all of our families to be characterized as families of peace. See, it's part of our witness to a broken world. Do you understand this? Let me tell you something. Our world is is angry right now. People are bitter. I've never seen people treat each other like they have during this past year. I just went out to Denver a few weeks ago, and I was shocked. I had never seen so many people yelling and being rude and mean to other people. I looked at my wife several times on our trip, and I said, man, this world's changed in the last year. This is an angry, bitter world. It's changed. I told my best friend, I said, listen, next time you travel, I want you to pay attention. 
People are angry and mad. Watch how they treat each other. He called me a couple weeks ago from the Minnesota airport, and he said, I have never in my life seen so many people yelling at each other, being rude to each other, being mean to each other. And so what's going on right now in our world is people have lost the peace. They're angry, they're bitter, they're resentful, and it's always us and them in every scenario. And then Jesus, out of history today, reminds us, He says, for us, those of us who call ourselves the followers of Christ, he says, we are to be called peacemakers. And when we love people and treat each other with respect and kindness, guess what's going to happen? The world is going to look at us and they're going to say, these are the children of God. When they look at our families that are filled with grace and mercy and kindness, the world's going to go, that is. Those are the children of God. It's one of these fascinating uh, uh, beatitudes where Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. But then he goes on to say, here's what the world is going to say about you. The world's going to say, you are a child of God. Now, you might be saying, James, I want that. I want my family to be uh, peaceful. But my family has a lot of dysfunction. Can I get an amen? amen? All right. And you're like, hey, my family has a lot of dysfunction. And to be honest, James, I'm not the cause of it. And that might be true. You might not be the cause of it. But every family, whether it's in your household or someone outside of your household, every family has a difficult person. I believe it's a spiritual principle. Every family has a difficult person. Let's, let's, just, let's just prove the point here. Raise your hand if your family has a difficult person in it. Raise your hand. Keep them up. Okay. Now, if you did not raise your hand, keep your hands up. If you did not raise your hand, you might be the difficult person (laughs) in your family. Please forgive me. I'm so sorry. Today should be encouraging. It's just right there. You can't not do that joke, okay? It's just right there. Families have difficult people in them. And maintaining peaceful relationships is difficult and can be very challenging. And if we're not careful, we can move from a family who has just a difficult person or two in it to being a family who operates at where dysfunction is our norm. Some families operate with dysfunction, and it's just normal. And it can easily happen where over time family members navigate into this mode. You hurt me? Okay, I'm going to hurt you. You gossip about me? I'm going to gossip about you. You run your mouth about me? I'm going to run my mouth back to you. You betray me, I'm going to betray you. And families can shift into this dysfunctional role, and it becomes a cycle. Now, here's what I'm going to do. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. I'm going to use a married husband and wife as an example. Because sometimes we slip into these dysfunctional, you hurt me, so I'm going to hurt you cycles. And, And what I'm going to show you is a thing called the crazy cycle, okay? And the reason it's called the crazy cycle is because at any moment, if we choose to show love and respect, we stop the cycle. And that's why it's crazy, because we can stop it at any moment. But let me show you the crazy cycle. Okay, here it goes. It simply works like this. And so we got a husband and wife. We got spouse one, spouse two. So maybe spouse one, either in public or privately, disrespects the other spouse, embarrasses them, says something negative about them. So, so they're disrespected. Well, when you're disrespected, you kind of lose that loving feeling, right? You don't want to come home the next day and be like, look, I was thinking about you at work today, and so I ordered you this, and you're amazing, and you're beautiful. No. When you're disrespected, what happens? You disrespect me, so I'm going to withhold loving feelings from you. I'm not going to shower you with love. I'm not going to give you encouraging words. I'm not going to whisper sweet nothings into your ear. No, no. You disrespect me, I'm going to withhold love. And here's what happens, okay? So the first person withholds respect, okay? And then it goes into a cycle. Well, now the second person, well, they're not going to give any love. And this cycle goes on where over and over again, all of a sudden a marriage has constant disrespect and they're withholding love. And because one person is not getting the love, they continue to disrespect. And then the person, because they keep getting dis- disrespect, keeps withholding love. And then eventually both of them are disrespecting each other and both of them are withholding love. And this is pretty much the cycle that happens before divorce. And here's what's crazy about it. Okay? It can be stopped by loving and respecting each other. Now let me give you a scenario. Say Gina and I, 
um, we go out to lunch with a new couple from our church. And we don't know this new couple. We go to P.F. Chang's, and we order some uh, egg rolls. It's, it's a God-given, glorious moment. We're having a good time. And then it's around Christmas time, so uh, the wife of this new couple looks at my wife and says, Well, what are you hoping to get for Christmas? And then if my wife responded, you know what? If James would just start brushing his teeth and wearing deodorant again, <laughs> that would be enough for me. Or, you know, what if he doesn't lose all of our money in the stock market again this year? That would be a Christmas miracle. Now, do you think that the next day I would come home from work with some candy and some flowers and a poem I wrote from her? Lord, no. I would be humiliated. Now, I could see myself writing a poem, you know. Roses are red, violets are blue. I should have listened to my mother when she said not to marry you. And, I, 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 and then we would be in the crazy cycle, right? I'm going to withhold love. You're going to disrespect me. And, and this can go on and on. By the way, this lack of love and respect keeps us in the crazy cycle. And this isn't just a husband and wife thing. This is a sibling thing. This is a parent-child thing. My brother and I, for years, from elementary school all the way through high school, we lived in the crazy cycle. He hurt me, I hurt him. He told on me, I told on him. It didn't even have to be true. But like, mom, daddy's making a bomb in his room. It didn't matter. I, we, we, we just treated each other with hatred because you do something to me, I'm going to do something to you. And we lived in the crazy cycle. But then my brother and I came to Christ. For the last 20-some years, we love each other. We really do respect each other. Last year during a pandemic, we probably called each other maybe 40 times, like, how are you doing, man? Your family okay? You guys got everything you need? Are you doing fine? We jumped out of the crazy cycle because Christ entered into our relationship. This also goes on with parents and, and, and children. Maybe some of you, you have a parent that you still have not forgiven because of something they said to you 20 years ago. I don't know what the scenario is for you. Maybe you're, you're trying to raise your family, you got your kids, your life is stressful, but maybe your mom is always peering over your shoulder saying, you need to do this, this is how you need to do it. And you're like, mom, stay out of it. Or maybe it's even worse, where it's the mother-in-law doing that, and you're not going to say something to her, so you go to your husband like, tell your mom to stay out, you know, and, 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 and we have these. Or maybe it's between you and your kids, or you and your grandkids, and, and where they're constantly fighting, and you're always like, hey, listen, I'm, don't make me pull this car over. I'm going to count to three. You count to three, nothing happens. You count to five, nothing happens. You count to 40, they're still fighting, so you just go home and take a bath. <laughs> and they continue to fight. Families can get into this crazy cycle. This is one of the reasons why Jesus had us change the way we thought, the way we think about relationships. Uh, we're going to look at some Beatitudes today, and the first one we're going to look at, or the main one we're looking at today, is from, again, chapter 5, verse 9. Now, I grabbed some direct thoughts and quotes from Life Church in Oklahoma, and I think they're going to help us in some significant ways today. But let's look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 9 again. It says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Now, pay attention to this. Again, it's blessed are the peacemakers, not the peacekeepers. Now, I want to focus in on this word peace. In the original biblical language, there's two different words for peace. In the New Testament, it's the word irene. Okay, but in the Old Testament, we get the Hebrew word for peace, which is shalom. We've all heard the word shalom, right? Shalom. And shalom nowadays, in our own modern culture, it means this. Oh, hey, blessings to you. Uh, welcome to the house. I hope things are well with you. Now, shalom today has really lost what it originally meant. When Jesus was talking about shalom, and us having peace in our homes, being peacemakers. What he was saying is, he wasn't just saying like, hey, I hope that there's, you know, not only that there's an absence of bad things in your life. Or Jesus wasn't just saying, hey, I hope that you have a strife-free home. No, Jesus was saying this because here's what shalom originally meant. It means I want the highest good for you. I want the best of the best for you. I want things to be marvelous in life. I want you to be blessed. I want your home to be joyful. I want your home to be full of the Holy Spirit. And I want there to be fruit and happiness. I want the highest good. I want the best for you. Not, it's just not just an absence of strife. Because nowadays, <laughs> peace just means we're not fighting. 
But originally when Jesus was teaching his scripture, he was saying, no, it's more than just not fighting. It means that there's an immense love and kindness and respect in the home. And that's why, again, it says that, that when people see this in our households, especially today, because the world is at each other's throats. But today when they look at a family like, that's weird. They're loving each other. They're kind to each other. They're respectful to each other. The world says, okay, I don't know how to get that, but we need that. And that's the difference. And that's, again, why it says, you will be called children of God. Now, let's just remember this. When Jesus taught the Beatitudes, they were countercultural. For thousands of years, before Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are those who bring shalom, what was the rule of that day for thousands of years? Eye for an eye. Tooth for a tooth. You steal from me, I'm going to steal from you. You hit me, I'm going to hit you. You murder somebody in my family, we're going to murder somebody in your family. And so when Jesus came along and said, no, 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 we're going to bring peace. This was counterculture because you got to remember, for thousands of years, the world lived, think about this, in the crazy cycle. The crazy cycle was life. That's how you did life. You lived in the crazy cycle. Then Jesus interrupts history. And he says, no, my people don't live this way. We don't do life this way. Okay, let me give you a couple things to fill in or take some notes. I want to remind you again that blessed are the peacemakers, not blessed are the peacekeepers. It's a huge difference. And for years, I'll be full confession. My natural bent is to be a peacekeeper. Can anybody else tell me you're, yeah, we, some of us, that's our natural bent. And I want to put, I want you to put this in your notes just to differ, differentiate. Peacekeepers often avoid conflict to keep the peace. Isn't that fascinating? Peacekeepers often avoid conflict to keep the peace. And peacekeepers, what they'll do is they'll work around the issues, not through the issues, trying to keep peace. We work around the issues. And we see this all the time with our families, don't we? we our families, even though people we know, they got stuff against each other. We come together for these big dinners, these big family functions, and we're all like, shh, shh. We're all awesome today. We're going to be great family. No one's going to say anything negative. And, and, and so we have all these family meals when you know there's tension. And then all of a sudden, one year, somebody says something sarcastic or smart aleck. And all of a sudden, boom, someone blows up. And they're like, let me tell you something. You have always been ugly. And you have, uh, I, and, and, and I don't like your teeth. And, and, and mom loves me way more than she loves you. And your husband, oh, he smells, and, 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 and we lose our mind. Our whole family's like, pass the beans. And, and, and we're like, what's going on? Hey, here's what's going on. For years, we've been avoiding the conflict. And then somebody blows up. It's years of peacekeeping. Instead of actually working through our relationship issues with each other. I'm okay. My family is full of peacekeepers. I'm going to give you guys a warning. I'm going to tell you a story about my family that's very true. And you just need to understand all of us come from little different cultures, okay? And things that are normal in my family might not be normal in your family, but it's just the way it is in my family. My dad is one of the world's sweetest men. He loves me and encourages me like nobody's business. My dad also loses his mind sometimes and flips out and screams and yells. Not violent at all, but loses it sometimes. And then it's over within like 10 seconds. And he's like, cool. That's it. We've grown up about around this. This is life. This is normal. It doesn't even phase us. Okay. Matter of fact, when he's losing his mind, we're usually looking at each other smiling like, <laughs> it's just normal. Okay. So we're at Thanksgiving dinner two years ago. And there's a chair between my mother and father. It has rollers on it. And uh, we're in the middle, and we are in the middle going around telling our blessings to each other. And all of a sudden, my dad takes the chair on rollers, flings it all the way across the kitchen floor. It goes, and then slams up against the kitchen cabinets. And my first thought was, this is funny. And I laughed, instinctive childhood response. And I laughed. Um, and then my next thought was, how on earth did he not hit the butcher block or the refrigerator? I mean, if he did this a hundred more times, I was like sitting there going like, wow, that was really impressive. Like, I mean, anyway, so, so I'm, I'm just there because it's not weird to me. And then somebody says, is everything okay? 
And then my dad said, yeah, your mom kept bumping the chair into my knee. That was it. He got bumped with a chair into his knee, and he flung a chair across the room. Makes sense, right? And so my sister-in-law, who's hilarious, uh, is married to my brother, who has the exact same personality as my father. She goes, without skipping a beat, goes, well, I guess I got that move to look forward to in my future. (laughs) It was awesome. It was awesome. (laughs) So we all start dying laughing. Like, we're dying laughing at the table. And then it's over, and we're like, all right, whose turn was next for the blessings of the year? And we went back to talk about how great Jesus is and how he's blessed our lives. And that was just, and so I get to, uh, I get back from Thanksgiving, and that week I had a counseling appointment set up. By the way, I would encourage you to have a counseling appointment set up after Thanksgiving, after Christmas, after Easter, (laughs) or any family vacation. Okay, so I'm talking to my counselor. And he says, hey, how was Thanksgiving? I said, oh, you're not going to believe this. I got a great story. This is hilarious. I told him the story. He looked utterly appalled. (laughs) And I go, no good? (laughs) And he goes, that's messed up, man. I go, well, what would your family would have done? And they're from around here, so they have some normalcy. And he said, well... If our father did that or anybody in our family did that, we would dismiss the children and the teenagers from the room. And then we would say, hey, this behavior is unacceptable. And then we would talk about what steps they're going to take to get into counseling. And then we would pray together as a family. And I was like, pretty pretty good. That's actually, (laughs) that thought did not occur to us. (laughs) I'm looking forward to dismissing the children and, 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 and confronting my father who throws chairs. Uh, <laughs> here's the bottom line. My family keeps peace. We're working on it. But his family makes peace. All right, which, which family is going to honor Christ more in the long run? It's probably going to have more peaceful dinners, less chairs rolling across the floor. It's because they're, they're bold enough to make peace. Peace. And see, we believe, see, a peacemaker will embrace conflict to keep the peace. That's what a peacemaker will do. And, and we believe that, that we don't work around issues, we work on the issues. And with the help of the Prince of Peace, Jesus, we believe that there can be peace in our homes. And I want to remind us, again, the key thought of this series is what? We don't just want to be Christian homes, we want to be Christ-centered homes. And if we're going to be Christ-centered homes, here's what that means. It means that Jesus isn't just a part of our life, that Jesus is our life. And so we do things differently because it matters. Let me show you again how much it matters. Because the way you keep peace in your family, more than ever in history, probably in the United States right now, this is where we shine the light to the world that is in darkness. Paul. Here's what he says, Romans chapter 12. He says, first of all, don't repay evil for evil. So he's backing Jesus up saying, all right, no more crazy cycle in our culture. And then he says, be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Pay attention here. He said, hey, the world's watching us. The world's watching the way we interact. Our witness is through the way we interact. And then here's this very powerful statement. He says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at a life at peace with everyone. Now, pay attention there. This scripture is not for the person next to you. You're not like, oh, I hope they get this. As far as it depends on who? You. You. That scripture is for who? You. As far as it depends on you. Okay. And and, and so then it goes on to say this. Do not be overcome by evil, but instead overcome evil by good. So again, blessed are the peacemakers where they'll be called children of God. So if we're going to be a christ in our home, we're, we're, we're going to be peacemakers. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. We're about ready to wind down here. For the next few moments, I'm going to give you three simple ways to be a peacemaker at home. Ready? Here we go. Take some notes. These are good. Number one. Number one today. We tell the truth in love. We tell the truth in love. Ephesians says this. We will speak the truth in love growing in every way to be more and more like Christ. So, that, so we actually become more like Christ when we do this. It grows us. Now, I want to pay attention because in a Christ-centered home, we tell the truth in love. Notice that it does not say, yell the truth in love. It's tell 
the truth and love. And, and, you know, we don't say, hey, will you stop leaving your shoes out everywhere? That's an actual problem in our household. No, we're not yelling the truth and love. We tell the truth and love. Now, a lot of us have taken counseling courses in college or we've been to counseling. And so there's some principles, big time principles that we want to remind ourselves of today. Number one, okay, we, we talk to each other. We tell the truth during non-conflict times. During non-conflict times. So in other words, uh, when a shoe is getting thrown at you in anger, that's not when you say, oh yeah, and I hate your mom. That's not, <laughs> okay? We don't bring up new issues, okay? No, we, we wait till anger has subsided so we can have a Christ-centered conversation where we bring Jesus into the conversation. The second thing we do is we attack the issue, not the person, we attack the issue. We confront the issue, never the person. Because if someone feels attacked, they're not going to respond. They're going to get defensive. Okay? Let me share with you how this works in my household. My daughter, I have the sweetest, kindest, most loving daughter. She just brings so much joy to my life. And, and she's awesome. She just got a job at Panera. And she's hooking us up for a discount. She's finally paying off. And it's... God is so good. Anyways, um, but if my daughter were to go missing and we sent in a search and rescue team, it would take less than an hour to find her because she leaves trails. This is where she ate and everything's left here on the coffee table. This is where she took off her shoes in the middle of the room. And then over here, that's where she did her schoolwork, and it's all over the place. And you could just follow along. Um, sometimes when you go into her room to talk to her, you got to put on a hazmat outfit. And, and now, my daughter is awesome. Now, let me tell you what happens. There have been times over the years where I've said, hey, stop being a slob. Pick up after yourself. Let me tell you how she does not react when I react that way. She does not go. Oh, Father, <laughs> thou art so wise and patient and kind with me. Please forgive me, for I have sinned against our home and brought anguish and filth. No, she doesn't do that. No, we usually, it gets combative. So for the last few years, I've had to approach during non-conflict times. And I don't attack her, I attack the issue. I just simply say, hey, um, you know what? After daddy's worked all day, and I have to clean up after you, um, I feel, it just feels a little disrespectful to me. And I'd love for you to help me out, you know? And, and, or I'll say things like, hey, you know what? Will you do me a big favor? Will you just clean up after yourself? Daddy will really appreciate that. And when I do it that way, she actually responds in a very healthy way. Like, oh, sure. And she'll say, I'm really sorry. I'll get on it. And you know what? For the next 12 hours that she cleans up after herself, <laughs> It's, it's absolutely amazing until we start the cycle over again. But the point is, is, that, is how we approach it. We approach it non-conflict times. Number two, um, peacemakers apologize when we're wrong. We apologize when we're wrong. James says this in chapter 5. He says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you might be healed. Could you imagine how conflict would be different in our families if every time uh, we did something wrong to each other, we said, hey, I, I was wrong. Please forgive me. I confess my sin. Let's pray together. That would change our families. We would be weird. Like we would be so different, right? Like I blew it. Let's pray together and ask God to help our family be better. Like that sounds crazy, but it's actually what scripture tells us to do. It actually says, confess your sins and then pray for each other. That's what we're supposed to do. And, and, and see, what we do often is instead of confessing our sins, we'll say stuff like, oh, oh I'm so sorry you're upset, you big baby. You, you know, we, we, we have those things where we have a hard time saying we're wrong. And, that, and, and those things are not apologies. An apology is, I'm sorry I belittled you in front of your friends. There's no excuse for that. That was wrong. I'm really sorry I didn't consider you. I, I should have called you when I was late. I can see why you're worried. Let me tell you, early in our marriage... I learned this lesson. I might have shared this story before. I can't remember, but uh, I uh, was early on in marriage, and, and, you know, I hadn't hung out with my friends since we got married. And right after work, I took off my friends, but I didn't call my wife. And I was thinking, like, what's the big deal? I'm a pastor. It's not like I'm going to Skid Row and, you know, 
going to a strip club, you know, I'm, I'm, no, or, or anything like that. No, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go play basketball. I'm going to play a video game, you know. So I'm not, you know, she doesn't need to worry about me. Thought I was no big deal. Well, my wife thought it was a big deal. And she started going from house to house looking for me, you know, before cell phone days, you know. And she's going from house to house, and she's convinced I'm dead. Something's happened to me because I'm her responsible husband, and I'm not, I haven't checked in. So she ends up at my parents' house. Not great. And um, I'm in trouble for capital T. I finally call and check in. She's not happy with me, okay? And then I show up to my mom and dad's house. All on the way over there, I'm feeling these feelings of remorse. What is remorse? Remorse is I got caught, right? That's remorse. It's not repentance. It's like, oh, how am I going to, how am I going to work this out? Uh, I prayed with my friend because he was suffering. No, 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 don't lie. I just wanted to play basketball. You know, so I'm, I'm working through all this stuff. I get to my, the front door of my mom and dad's house. My dad grabs a hold of me and it's the only time he's ever interfered fully in our marriage. And he says, son, you blew it. Do not make excuses. Tell her you were wrong and ask for forgiveness. So I went into that room and I was remorseful. But when I saw the pain in her eyes, that's when my heart broke. And then I asked for forgiveness. And I haven't done any, I'm a, we, we still check in, hey, just out of respect, you know, hey, here's where I'm at. You, you see, and there's a big difference between remorse and repentance. Remorse is, I'm sorry I got caught, but re, repentance is, I was wrong, I've sinned. And, and I want you to write this down. See, we say, I'm sorry when we make mistakes. But we say, will you forgive me when we sin? When we sin against each other or do wrong to each other, we ask for forgiveness. I'm sorry as for whenever, you know, I dropped the dish. I forgot to switch laundry over. I'm sorry, that was a mistake. But when I sin against you, it's forgive me. Again, blessed are the peacemakers. All right, last thing as we close out today. The last thing that peacekeepers do or peacemakers do is they forgive and let go. They forgive and they let go. I have a friend... Uh, some family friends that I've been around this family for many years, and there's four siblings. And um, they're all grown now. They all have their own children, and they're wonderful people on their own. But a few months goes by, and every few months, they get one of them or two of them get into a huge fight with each other. And let me tell you what happens. I've witnessed a plenty of these fights at family gatherings and reunions and birthday parties. And let me tell you what happens every single time. Somebody says something, they get mad, and they start yelling at each other. And this, they say one of three statements. You were a jerk to me in high school. You treated me bad when we were young. Or I thought you were really mean to me in middle. I mean, they, they always go back to high school. They go back to middle school. Here they are. They're in their 40s. Let me tell you what's never happened. They've never sat down and said, forgive me. I shouldn't have treated you this way. And they never said, I forgive you. And what happens is they'll get along as, as a family for a while, but then something will happen and they'll blow up. And they always go back to something that happened many years ago. See, your family cannot make peace as long as there's unforgiveness from the past. Let's look at this last scripture as we close out today. What does it say? In Colossians, it says, to bear with each other and forgive one another if someone has any grievance against anyone. Now, the very next phrase says this, we are to forgive as we forgive, as the Lord forgave us. How do we forgive? We forgive as the Lord forgave us. Let me ask you a question. When Jesus Christ forgave you, did he look at your life and goes, whoa, you're awesome you got to get to heaven. You're amazing. Or, wow, you're so special and so phenomenal. We're just going to give you free salvation. No, it was in your darkest moment when you were in the midst of the most evil of your life, he came down and he showed grace upon you. He gave you mercy and he forgave you. So we forgive not when someone cleans up their act. We forgive not when someone becomes perfect. We forgive not when someone has, you know, groveled to us. We forgive as the Lord forgave us. We pour out grace because we receive grace. And that's the only way to bring healing to our families. All right, we're done for today. Here's what I want to do. I want to shift into a prayer time. And I want all of you to close your eyes and bow your head. And for the next few moments, I want this just to be a place of confession and repentance and, 
and healing. Because I believe God wants to do a work. All right, will you raise your hand? No one's looking around. Who in here has, um, you're in the middle of some conflict in your family. Raise your hand. Okay, I see all those hands. I see those hands. Who in here, you would say, um, you have some bitterness and resentment towards other people in your family right now. Raise your hand. All right, I see all those hands. Who in here has not let go and you've chosen not to forgive some people in your family? Raise your hand. Okay. Here's what I want to do. I want to, I want us just to go before the Lord right now. And I'm going to pray for you, then I'm going to give you a moment to pray. God, we come to you right now and, and, and we want to be peacemakers because we know that this is part of our witness, but this is also how we bring you glory. And this is how we reflect your character actually in our lives. But family is difficult, Lord. So God, I pray for grace and mercy to be upon all these families, members who raise their hands today. And God, help us to forgive those who have hurt us, those we have resentment towards. God, help us to make peace in our families. Help us to tell the truth in love in a, in a way in which your Holy Spirit could enter into the conversation. Father, we come to you right now. And for those of you right now who raised your hand, I just want to give you a moment. I want to give you a moment to take those first steps where you, you, you go before the Lord and say, Lord, help me to forgive. Help me to, help me to love. Help me to uh, make peace. Just take a moment and lift those prayers up to the Lord. Jesus, we give you our families. We give you our brokenness. We give you our lives. And we, and we just ask God right now, I'm asking that you will do a work, a deep, deep work in, in our lives and in our families. God, some of us are absolutely heartbroken over our families. Some of us have experienced children who have been <laughs> nothing but rebellious. And I pray for some of us, we can't make peace because they will not choose peace. So God, I want to remind us of that scripture right now, as far as it depends on us. That's the commitment we make to you today, as far as it depends on us. We're going to do our part so that you can be brought glory, so that you can be exalted. Thank you for your grace and mercy. Let's stand together. We're going to close the service today with moments of celebration. We're thankful for what God's doing in our lives, and we're going to celebrate what God has been doing, and uh, we want you to sing with us. Let's rejoice as we close this day together. Let's sing. This is my testimony. This 
This is my testimony. Church, this is Chase, and here's Chase's testimony. Since I was 17, I had been heavily into smoking and selling weed. I was separated from God. Just about five months ago, I realized I was not happy where I was in life and decided to come to church to grow closer with God. Since I've come back to church, I have been sober and I have mended a lot of relationships within my family. I also got in huge trouble for weed and since I've turned my life to God, I'm no longer scared of the outcome. I am ready for my new beginning. This is Dawn and here's her story. Before I surrendered my life to Christ, I was searching for a way to fill my inner needs of loneliness through immoral relationships and smoking weed. Then one night, God revealed himself to me through my grandmother who shared her near-death experience with me. Since this night, I have made a 180 degree turn in my life and accepted Jesus as my savior through God's message of hope for the world. Testimony from death to life, cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Together, sons and daughters, walk with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Our God will finish what He started. This is my testimony. All right, church, listen to these words. Let's sing this out together. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not done. rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. From death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. Somebody praise the Lord today.
amazing was that to see people baptized today? That was, I believe that was our 27th baptism just this summer. There are good things happening here at our church. I wanna encourage you if today we can pray for you before you uh, leave this room. Uh, there will be prayer partners here in the front. If you're a prayer partner, you can come on down uh, and get ready right now. But if you have a need, if you need healing or a concern in your life and you wanna pray with someone who's trained to pray with you, they would love to do that uh, today. I also wanna tell you a little bit about next step. Uh, every person has a next step in their faith journey. Maybe that's learning about baptism or maybe it's learning about a small group or learning about how to serve and volunteer. But I believe that you have a next step. God has a next step for your journey. So I wanna invite you next week to a short informal gathering called Next Step where you get to meet some of our leaders, learn a little bit more about our church. You can text that keyword to the number there on the screen uh, to RSVP to learn a little bit more about Next Step. I also want to tell all of us that coming up in a few weeks, we're starting our fall spiritual growth journey. Well, what is a spiritual growth journey, you ask? Uh, A spiritual growth journey is a particular time of year that we as a church come together for six weeks uh, to do a few things, to attend worship weekly, to try a small group, and to meet with God daily. And during this spiritual growth journey, we're going to be looking at the man, Nehemiah, whose story is in the Bible, who faced incredible opposition, incredible challenges, yet he still remained faithful to what God had called him to. Our lives are crazy. Our lives are busy. We get pulled in all sorts of directions. Many of us here have a lot of responsibilities and a a lot of uh, cares that weigh on us. That's why a spiritual growth journey is a timely moment in our story, in our church, where we can focus on what God wants to do in our lives in growing and stretching our faith. So I encourage you to uh, text the keyword there on the screen to learn more about trying a small group for those six weeks. Well, as you go from here, know that God is with you. God is going before you. He is coming behind you. No matter what the rest of your week looks like, you are walking in the presence of God. Have a blessed week, everyone.